Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Conn Report. Wherever you get your podcast, you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media. That's A-M-P-I-R-E. Always much appreciated when you tune in. And don't forget, you can always read my work on ESPN.com. In a couple minutes, I'll be joined by Matthew Paris from the Washington Times and Sam Fortier from the Washington Post as we kind of dig into a lot of the defensive issues. I didn't real I didn't think it was going to go all defense, but it a lot did. And we kind of close on Sam Howell, but a lot of it was what's wrong with the defense? What can they change? Is it can they change scheme? What can they do to maybe get things turned around? Will they get it turned around? I know what a lot of your confidence is. There's 12 games left. So you got to ask the question: what can they do to do that? And so stay tuned for that in a couple of minutes. A couple of news items. Um, they, as you know, Derek Forrest and Jeremy Reeves were placed on injured reserve. They're both obviously both injured. Derek Forrest fractured his shoulder and then Jeremy Reeves partially tore his ACL. Now the length of their stay is still kind of to be determined whether I know with Forrest, for example, fractured shoulder, that could be a six week thing, but there's, you know, I think there's certainly the feeling is that he'll be back at some point. But is it a four-week stay? Well, it's too early for that. They were still waiting to get results, as I talk right now, from the bone scan. And so I think that will determine more of how long his stay will be. Maybe by Wednesday we have a better – by Wednesday afternoon, maybe we have a better idea. But as of now, I would say, you know, push – you know, certainly, clearly, at least four weeks because that's how long you have to be on there. But it could, it could be a couple more weeks than that. As far as Reeves go, he's going to get some more medical opinions to determine just – is, it, is he done for the year or is there a chance that he could come back? So I don't want to go anywhere with that just yet because we just don't know. And then with those two guys going on into reserve, Washington brought signed from the practice squad, linebacker DeJon Harris and safety Terrell Burgess. That's special teams help. I know a lot of people talk about Jabril Cox. Clearly he's not ready and just keep in mind that he's on the practice squad. Every other team in the NFL can sign him and nobody has. And he's also cut by Dallas. So I know a lot of people know the name. I don't know where his progress is at because it, they have so many other things to, to, to wonder about or to ask about that we haven't gotten down there because he's not the savior, folks. So if, if you're looking for improvement from him for linebacker, if, if he can do that, it will be more in 2024 if he is indeed that kind of a guy. Anyway, but just letting you know that. And so when they're bringing a guy like Harris up, it's going to be as much for spe- those, those guys are coming up for special teams. <clears throat> Finally, then you look at the situation. What are they going to do with rookie corner Emmanuel Forbes? They benched him during the Bears game. He's had a couple rough games and some other rough moments in other games. You know, the, clearly he's a rookie who has to learn. He's been put in some really tough situations for a rookie covering A.J. Brown, Stephon Diggs, D.J. Moore. I mean, those... Those are really good. Those are really good receivers and in, in, in Devontae Smith in there as well. But, you know, part of what I think they're looking for is the improvement in the technique as much as anything, because that will also then lead to improved play. I, and anyway, so what are they going to do with him? Is he going to be their third corner? I don't know. It wouldn't surprise me at all if Danny Johnson plays ahead of him come Sunday in Atlanta, because there's definitely more that they need and want to see from Emmanuel Forbes. Stay tuned for that. We'll, we'll monitor that one. Um, but it, w- it wouldn't shock me at all if Danny Johnson gets the nod ahead of him for Sunday, depending on how Forbes reacts, perhaps over the next couple of days in practice. Do they see something different from him in practice that maybe he was working on over a break or maybe something that settled into him with him? I don't know. And I know that there's a lot of things that rookies always have to learn. But it's something that he definitely has to learn because right now, and here's the thing, it's not just him. And I know, you know, it always comes across like you're blaming. It's not. This is a guy who's struggling and you've got it. You are they doing something? And yet the answer is they possibly could. So, you know, I, the kid still has talent. He's going to need time to grow and develop. This is part of it. So anyway, what everybody always wants to see is, again, you have a bad game. You have a bad week. You have a bad stretch. You have a bad month, whatever. How do you respond to it? And that's going to be the key that determines how much Forbes grows in the future. So anyway, that's it from me. So st- stay tuned for my conversation with Matthew Paris from the Washington Times and Sam Fortier from the Washington Post. Well, we're missing one guy, but I do have two of my kids back 
for another episode. I got Sam, Sam 48 from the Washington Post. If you're watching us on YouTube, you can see that he just came back from the skate park. And then we have uh, Matthew Paris from the Washington Times, who is leaving the Times. If I have this right, you're doing your OnlyFans account full time now. Congrats, Matt. I, I think that's awesome news. And, you know, is I do have that right, correct? Uh, in my major Teddy cosplay. That's a... okay. <laughs> <It's> a... <laughs> You guys would be very lucky if everyone hasn't just tuned out already. Yeah, <laughs> we're gonna lose your the... tiny cosplay. Yeah. yeah. So anyway, but Matthew is leaving the beat after what six and a half years. Matt, why don't you tell him where, what you're doing? Yeah. So I'm moving down to New Orleans to cover the Saints for the Times Picayune and the Advocate. So one paper down there, and should be quite different. But I'm pretty excited about it. So loved it here, and time to move on. Time to move on. But it is like, it's a loss, as we know. This is another loss to our beat reporting colleagues. Right. And it's a big loss because Matt's a really good guy and a very hard worker. And, and we like to make fun of him. And so it's nice to have yeah. something like that in the room. Um, so there's only a few of us left. Well, you have Sam now. so We still have Sam, but but it's not as much fun. It's Listen, it is fun to rag on Sam. And shout out. Sam's mom listening. So, you know, I know she always tunes in. So I appreciate that, but it is fun to have, it is fun to have that. But, you know, I feel like for me, we, we lost Pete. We're losing Matt. I mean, Sam is like, you're an only child in the house now, you know? Right. Yeah. Um, shout out to, shout out to Paris's mom, who I oh, like always enjoy talking to as well. And uh, you know, I, I like, it was funny. We were in the beat room on Monday. Maddie P was on a flight with a special guest if you want to reveal who that was oh, sure. not not um in the media room and it was you know in terms of the daily beat people it was just you me uh talking to kind you me nikki and standing and that's it was a it was a weird time and, and being on you know being on a zoom with you guys not pete and now we're losing you and everyone i love leaves me man it's, it doesn't feel very good well i'm still here so i don't know what that says about what you just said <laughs> but it is like just for people who know like Obviously, Sorry. there's a competition on this beat. Everybody wants to do a good job. You know, everybody wants to, you know, think that they did this or that. And, you know, I know you guys all look up to me, so I appreciate that. But yeah. but it is like you do get to get you can get close to people on this beat. I also think like with this <laughs> with this beat, what we've been through on this beat the last few years, I think it forges a slightly different bond. Do you know what I'm saying? So, yeah. And, and if you guys want to just, you know, copy my Snyder exclusive after this, you guys go ahead. But uh, it's been nice. Thank, knowing you. Thanks for contributing, Matt. Um, <laughs> but but it is, you know, it is, but don't you think in, in all seriousness, let's get the yeah. tissues out for a moment here. But it is, you know, okay. it, it has been. Again, you can you can compete against somebody and still respect them and still like them and still like being around them. And I think it's you know, whether some people may frown on that, I've always found it to be a healthier way to live because you still want to compete. I don't think anybody here competes any less because we like one another, but I do think there's a, there's been a nice bond in that room and it makes it a fun place to be. No, for sure. I mean, you see the competitiveness peak out every once in a while. And when that happens, you just leave that person alone and you try and go about your own competition and, and trying to get that exclusive or that story done. And when it's time to work, we actually work, but there's a lot of bits in between, which makes it fun. Yeah. It's, it's pretty hard for me to turn off the the bits, especially with Paris on the zoom and, and be earnest, but uh, just to, just to pull up a text that I got, I want to say it was yesterday or two days ago from Paris. He said, why does true media snap counts, which use PFF data, differ from the game book? They have Forbes at 193 defensive snaps and pro football reference slash Stathead has them at 201. Stathead uses the totals listed in each game book. And that is an incredibly niche specific question, but I think it really encapsulates like how attentive to the details Paris is and how hard he works and how he fact checks and double checks everything to make sure that like, He's giving good insight and he's, and he's telling you the right thing. And so, you know, just uh, gonna, gonna miss getting <laughs> random texts like that all the time. And I know that he's probably going to use my true media I account. Mean, I'm probably still going to, so yeah. But, yeah, and but it's, it's, that's the sort of thing that like, you know, in other places I've worked or with, you know, with other people, it's just, it's not a common thing. And I love nerding out over that stuff too. And uh, I'm going to miss getting texts like that about Washington. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, and again, we're, we're going to talk about football in a couple of minutes. So trust me. And it's, we're not going to have this turn into a, you know, Matthew Paris beat reporter, um, you know, uh, I don't know. Uh, we already uh, did that for Pete. Uh, yeah. Some those. melancholy moment. Like, you know, I don't <laughs> want to sit here and tear up over Matt Paris, but um, <laughs> no offense, man. <laughs> but it is like, I am curious, Matt, like, cause you have spent six and a half years on this beat. Where do you, you know, how do you look back? Like there have been so much, that has happened during that time. What would you tell someone in New Orleans about what it was like to cover this beat? Yeah, I think I captured a, a really an interesting time because it was, I think it was the franchise at its lowest point. But right when I started, it wasn't quite that yet. But the next two years, I think really kind of descended it there, you know, 2020 being the most chaotic in terms of not just because of the pandemic, but that's really when that was the year that led to the sale. Basically everything kind of started then, but you know, covering an ownership change, a name change, all these things that we thought were just impossible for years. Like I remember, you know, when I started, all those things were kind of just kind of laughed about. We'd always joke about it, but they actually happened. So it was a great experience to be able to cover all that. And, you know, I say this all the time, but you're not just a sports reporter on this beat. You're a, law reporter your court reporter your pretty much everything it really made me well-rounded and i think honestly that's why i landed the new job in new orleans because i know how to do yeah. stuff more than just sports now it made you well-rounded it did not make you speak up a lot though okay yeah, so, that's... so let's so let's speak up <laughs> on your la on, the, on this appearance but but it is true so you know how would you, you know where does it because you're right like we you have to be more than just a sports reporter on this beat so you know was there is there was there, well let me ask you this was there a particular story that you covered that you just like this is the one that's going to jump out because i mean the sale was the monumental one right you know, yeah anything beyond that like we're just like i couldn't believe this oh the name too are you just I mean, yeah the, the name i i kind of i'll take this a little bit different um and i'll, I'll kind of tie it back to the competition aspect to what we have because that I actually think 2020 was really a kind of a foundational year for me and becoming a better reporter because you just weren't at practice all the time. So you kind of had to do different types of stories. And as Alex Smith's kind of like miraculous comeback was playing out and we each kind of found our ways to dive into that story. I was really kind of proud of how I tackled that. I did a story where I talked to the screenwriters from draft day yeah. and, and, um, you know, the guy who wrote uh, Rudy and all those sorts of things. And like the, the great thing about this market is there's so much competition that you're always searching for ways to try and come at it from a different path. So, you know, I, I think the Alex Smith story, that's an on the field story that uh, I thought kind of stood out, but I mean, yeah, there, there's shit all over the place. <laughs> no, absolutely. But I think you're right. Look, this market really makes you better because of that anyways. So enough of the maudlin stuff with, right. with, with Matt leaving. So, but do you have something to say, Sam? I just I just want to say that I checked True Media actually just now, and um, Harris's retirement tour is about 450 Instagram stories and 78 tweets short of Pete Haley's. I was gonna say, like, <laughs> yeah, Pete yeah. Pete said Pete Haley set a record there um, with that one. I don't know. It was like I don't know any like. It was like a like a. It was like he was Michael Jordan leaving the right. NBA for God's sake. Well, I've made this joke in the room, but I'll do it for your listeners. Is my uh, I am uh, Paul Pierce from the Clippers bench saying you thought you was uh, Draymond Green yelling they thought you was Kobe uh, to Paul Pierce at the free throw line because that was Co it's Kobe is Pete and I'm Paul Pierce getting a sad retirement door. So <laughs> there you go. There you go. Anyways, before you leave, you do have a little bit more football to talk yeah. here, and so. You know, the, the serious topic is the commanders are two and three and where are things headed and, and et cetera, et cetera. But first let's start like Sam, we had a chance to talk to, and Matt, obviously you would have listened in or, or known, knew what, what Ron Rivera said. Did anything jump out to you about what he said on Monday after they had the chance on the weekend to kind of reflect on their mis mistakes or whatever? Basically, his decision that to say that 
the defense is the byproduct. The, the explosive plays are the byproduct of a lot of different things. You know, in experience, it's it's a lot of coverages, it's uh, a lot of mistakes, and and there's really no one culprit. And, and the decision to stay with Jack Del Rio and the defensive staff and all the front office people, like more, rather than like what he said, you know, just with his words, I think his actions really illustrated yeah. to me that. He's going to bet on his guys going forward. And I know you and Nikki talked about like why it's more complicated to move on from people than, than they expect, but just coming out of the weekend and saying, yeah, I mean, we're going to have a shorter leash on guys like Emmanuel Forbes. We're not going to tolerate growing pains as much, but to me, the, the most significant thing is they made no changes and they're going to bet their jobs on basically improving what they have with what they have. Yeah. I mean, they've done that in the past. I think it's worked out for them with it so I I understand them going that route but I think the thing I took from Monday's press conference was either his the things he didn't say or the things he tried to clumsily explain I I texted a few of you guys of trying to understand what Ron was talking about when Ben asked about the free agency class and um, the the rookie class he gave a very strange answer kind of saying it was on Sam Howe, I don't think he necessarily meant it, but I think the things covering Ron, especially the last few years, is when he gets himself into trouble, he just kind of is searching for an answer, and those words don't always make a lot of sense, and I think it, it's misinterpreted. Like, it, I think sometimes, I don't know if he views media as an obligation that he just has to do when he's trying to get through the 10 minutes or whatever, but it's stuff like that, especially when things don't go well. It's very confusing. And I don't think that – that look, he's not going to be able to say anything short of, like, I'm firing Jack Del Rio that will make fans happy. But I think in times like this, you know, people are looking for satisfying answers, and he didn't provide many of them um, in his latest press conference anyway. He's he's also someone – you talk about satisfying the answers, I think – there's also the there's also the men that sentiment. Should he be showing more emotion, like on the sure. sidelines or things like that? What I do don't you think? get that. I mean, yeah. Personally, I, that's just not. I mean, he can show no emotion and they can win 15 games, and I think fans would be happy. You know, it's. I, I get it. I mean, I guess the halftime thing that's been a radio topic here this week is a little different. But even then, I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with letting your players sort it out in a situation like that. I mean, they're the ones performing on the field. I, I think a lot is made of Rivera's emotions on the sideline. Correct. A little bit more than there needs to be, to be honest. And I think like, I can't remember who said this to me. It was someone in the chargers locker room, maybe, maybe Phillip rivers, maybe uh, Antonio Gates when I was there, but they said like players can tell when you're forcing something or when you're not being yourself. And I think that you have to be genuine. So if you're Ron Rivera and you're not fired up on the sideline or you think that, Hey, like the best way to do this is not address the team. I mean, the owner can make the decision. Hey, is, is this coach making the right decision and how he addresses this team? But if the coach is doing what he feels is necessary and, you know, over, you know, Ron's nearly 200 career games, that's what he's deciding to do. Like, I don't know. I, I, I think it's more of a, a radio topic than it is like an actual topic in the I, locker room. I, I agree with that. And the other, the other thing to keep in mind, like, they actually did play well in the second half up until the last five, six minutes of that game. So whatever happened in the locker room at halftime, it was a better result than the opening, whatever they did in the locker room before the game. So, you know, until the, like the last few minutes when it just kind of got away from them. But um, so, yeah, I, I tend to agree with that. And it's funny because I've heard in other sports of team of coaches doing that. I don't know how prevalent it is, but I've heard of others doing it. So I just don't, I don't want to, I don't, we need to, I don't think it needs to be given a lot of oxygen with us. So, but, but like speaking of changes though, so are there, we, we know they're not doing any coaching changes, et cetera. Are there other changes that you think they could do this and it might help? Well, not necessarily in the spirit of this question, but one of the things we didn't mention off the press conference is Derek Forrest is going I, on. I was just going to, I wanted to ask, yeah. And he and Jeremy Reeves. So yeah, you want to, let's go there first and the impact yeah. of that, because like for it could be a decent stay for Forrest and it, Jeremy, they're still finding out about the knee as to how long it will be for him. But you know, wh- what about those, that impact? I think it's a huge impact because even though Derek Forrest, I don't think was having his best year, particularly in terms of missed tackles, like he played 99% of the snaps. You had a certain trust that 
he he knew what he was doing you know his third year in the system and cam curl trusts him a lot and now yeah. you're going to have a younger guy in percy butler and you're going to have a guy who in Quan martin who has not played a defensive snap this year and and really you know ha- has had trouble getting onto the field had the concussion in week one and as percy butler said you know guys those versatile defensive backs are, are good in theory but asking them to play and rotate as much as they would like to early on in your first year like that's very difficult percy mm-hmm. butler in camp was telling us like I couldn't play fast because I was just having to say, okay, what is my assignment? What personnel are they in? What are they doing in motion? How does that change my responsibility? And so this is going to be a huge challenge for Quan Martin. And, and they're tied for seventh, I believe, right now in terms of 37 explosive plays allowed. And, and a lot of those have been on the defensive backfield, either, you know, Percy Butler turning the wrong way and cover two on that first touchdown for the Bears. I mean, you know, <laughs> the defensive backfield is struggling and now they have to put in someone who I think is going to have a very challenging time. And so, if you're if you're looking for a bounce back from the defense, Jack Del Rio's got his work cut out for him. Right, and I think for me is just a, sorry. Were you going to say something? No, like go ahead, go ahead. I, I think related to your first question, Kaim, uh, of what changes they can make, I think the thing I'm most interested in is see what they do, at least with the defense, is how much do they stick with the three safeties now, trying to right. give Quan that responsibility, or do they just stick with uh, you know, Benjamin St. Juice on the outside, Kendall Fuller, and then have Danny Johnson be in the slot or do they keep Benjamin St. Juice in the slot and have Danny Johnson play the outside? Danny Johnson was the guy on my flight, by the way, to tie yes. this back even earlier to where Sam was. He was coming back but from the Dad also assumes that they're going to keep Emmanuel Forbes on the bench. And I don't know that that's the case. Sure. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I would imagine at, le- at least six for a game. Now I don't have that source. I, any time you would know better than I would, but uh, it is, I, I think they're at least going to give this a, shot us to see how it looks if the defense plays a lot better with Johnson maybe if Johnson struggles they go back to Forbes but um yeah because I mean Danny Johnson didn't have the best game even I mean he he could have given up a touchdown pass too if the pass is better so you know they all everybody in that secondary has struggled which has been this surprise to me um but I I do think you bring up a good point is does what does the what is the impact on the three safety packages and Sam too I also wonder are they sometimes like there's such a big emphasis here on the position versatility that ha- have they gone overboard in trying to attain that? This is the discussion we've had with the offensive line, right? Like right. you need, and when you whiff on, you know, what was it? Three in a row, like tackles that became guards. Like at some point you need a guy who plays one position well, and right. they have not prioritized that, you know, even going back to, you know, they, they didn't draft Kyle Hamilton, obviously, and, and they drafted Jahan Dotson. But, like, you need a guy that can play safety well, or you need a guy that can play the SWAT well. And they they don't have that, especially – and I think, like, the bigger predicament for them right now is not even, hey, can this guy play multiple positions? It's getting them online fast enough, but, like, teaching them all the responsibilities you want them to handle. And so, like, even if you do have that position flex, you're building in, like a Percy Butler, almost a, a year – of where they can learn and then, you know, kind of get into the flow. Now with Quan Martin, if, if you had just drafted a slot, like, okay, maybe, you know, he picks it right. up pretty fast, but but now we have to get, teach a guy multiple roles. It just it just lengthens the time you have you have to coach them, and it also, like, makes the barrier of entry higher. And so, I mean, that's just it, – it's a big risk, you know? It is. And the other thing I wonder, too, about with change – because we go, you go over the personnel, and there's, you know, I don't know that there's a magic elixir to that you can say, okay, this guy can come in and do this. So then you look at scheme, or you look at strategy. Defensively, we'll we'll stay there for now. But is there any tweak with the scheme? Are were they playing too much man the last two weeks? And I know some of it's related to RPO stuff, et cetera. But is that something that you say, you know, that you go back to like just maybe play more zone? Would that help? Can they do something like that? And how much would that help? Yeah, I mean, I would imagine it would. I, I don't know the numbers of the percentages of how often they've been in man versus zone this year. But I mean, that Tevin Jenkins quote that kind of circulated after the game, it certainly appeared that Washington was at least presenting man before switching to zone kind of after the snap and the safeties weren't reacting fast enough to get back in their zones. And that's why Chicago was able to kind of find the holes that they did. So I, I do think maybe they just have to be more sound uh, fundamentally. I, I think in terms of scheme too, I thought, I, I think an interesting point that Rivera brought up was 
trying to find that line of how much does how much do we need to allow guys to go with the techniques they're comfortable with versus the techniques they're trying to teach i think going back to the manual discussion that that maybe suits him especially um because when rivera said that the techniques that they had him running in training camp he looked a lot better maybe he's just reverting back to some old habits but um I think those types of things is, yeah, how much man zone do they want to deploy? Because their zone is kind of like a man anyway, at least with the the match patterns. And then the the techniques of what these guys are running and how they cover guys, I think matters a lot too. And and I will say like, they did play a lot more man against Chicago. And I think, you know, Justin Fields talked about that and he struggled against, against zone coverages in the first four games, but, I don't, you know, it's funny because I'm watching, I saw what Jenkins said, and then I'm watching it, wasn't quite sure it always matched up to that because some of the issues, I think they're in the right spot. They just bid on some action on a play or they were late rotating, whatever it was, but that's the, that's how they thought about it. So anyway, Sam, what do you think? Did they play too much man discussion is kind of interesting to me because I went back and looked at all 37 of the explosive plays they've allowed. They've allowed explosives in cover one, cover two, cover three, yeah. cover four. They've allowed it, you know, like, no, it's, it, it's, like it's, everything. It, it's been on multiple players, you know, like the, the first one right. in Chicago was Benjamin St. Juice biting on a double move. There's been plenty of double moves bid on by Emmanuel Forbes. I mean, cover two, the first touchdown they had, Percy Butler, right. as I said, right. like, turns the wrong way. Like that's a zone coverage. He just blows it. It's like, basic, yeah. I don't think playing more zone is going to magically fix the problems that they have. But I, I will say you're, I think you're absolutely right that it, it hasn't just been man, but a lot of the big plays the last two games have come in a man coverage. And so that's, that's where I wonder, can they help them? But the problem is you're right. Like in um, if the safeties aren't looking in the right spot in a cover two, and now you're losing one of your experienced guys back or, you know, younger, but experienced guys back there, what can you do? But you know, um, that's the only thing I wondered. Yeah, no, and I, I think there is credence to did they play too much man? But I think that people who are saying they need to play more zone, this is like a cure all silver bullet. Like, I think that's misguided. Yeah, um, yeah, agreed, agreed. And so, but I, I think for me, like this defense is probably at its best, kind of like they were last year, where they play a lot of too deep, too high stuff. And, you know, they force teams to sustain drives, they don't allow explosive plays. Like, you know, kind of like how the Bills do it in terms of forcing yeah. teams to drive down the field. And I know that they, to me, like when I go back and I watch all of those explosive plays and you see it happening all the time, like, and I know that Ron, when I asked him about it, didn't totally agree with this. But I mean, the theory for me is that it's possible that Jack has spent so much of the offseason and preseason and regular season preaching, we need to take the ball away more, that guys are playing more aggressive and they're allowing it to lead to over-aggression, like the Forbes and BSJ, you know, trying to jump routes. Um, he said that, you know, Ron said he wasn't mad at the Kendall Fuller one that he came down on for the DJ Moore play. That, that and was I, a perfectly, perfectly thrown ball. Right, right. I, I agree with that. But I'm saying, I think in general, I think there's just watching them on tape, like it's it just feels sometimes like they're a little bit over aggressive. And I wonder why that is particularly for a guy like Benjamin who normally, you know, is very aware of his help and, and where, you know, um, what schemes they're in. So I know that that like, to me, that just seems like a thing that stuck out and I don't have, you know, a, an objective data point to prove it, but it just, it feels like it when I watch them. Um, and so I think that could be a part of it as well. Could be. And, and, you know, there, there's certainly, I mean, every year the coaches emphasize turnovers, but because it was a bigger one in the, in media discussions with with Rivera during press conferences of the offseason, that's why they drafted Forbes. Um, so go ahead. Every every defensive player that we talked to said, "Yeah, we need to start fast and generate turnovers." And I'm, and, and I know I mean, that coaches always want to generate turnovers, but yeah. and, and they haven't started fast. So it, you know maybe they they're not always listening to their coaches for sure. But I I just think I don't know. I think it's possible. Do you do you think we were just completely fooled by the because like going into the season? Now listen, we saw they played well the last half of the year last year. The numbers are the numbers were good, and you know the numbers don't always tell everything. But it's not like we're it's not like they had top ten numbers, but we're a bottom third defense. So they were a good defense at the end of the year. And then this summer, you you know, did we get fooled by it? What did we miss this summer that is playing out? I mean, a part of this, I think, is that NFL defense is inherently more volatile than than yeah. offense. I think you have to always build in that variance. But also, I just, yeah, I mean, 
when, it's always been the case in Washington, right? You look at the collection of talent that they have and you think like, this must be better. And Forbes made sense because they needed to generate more turnovers and they had experienced guys in the fourth year of the system and the second year of the match yeah. zone coverage. Like I, everything suggested that this team could be a top 10 defense. I don't think that was a ridiculous discussion to have. No. Um, and Chase Young looked good when he was healthy early in camp. And he's, I think he's, 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 he's looks. Yeah. He doesn't, was, he's not. He was yeah, maybe their best was, player in Chicago. It was Eric oh, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, do we get fooled? Like, possible. I mean, it's, it's, yeah. it's some, some of this, like, some of the, especially the slow start stuff, like, sometimes it's hard to come up with a, a rationale of exactly why it's happening because it's just, it's, uh, sometimes you look at it and you're like, this should, this should not happen. Right. Well, and that's why, like, some of the mistakes are just like, I can't believe this guy did that because he doesn't usually. What do you think, Matt? Well, the slow starts for me are, are really hard to parse to because you look at the first game, they, I would say the defense started fast. They didn't allow a touchdown. They allowed Arizona to try and go down, but they still, they still made their impression on the game. Denver, they started slow in the first half, but I would say the reason Washington got back into that game is because the defense really cracked down, kind of kicked Denver's ass and, you know, the defense had seven sacks. I really think they turned that game around because the defense played up to its standards. And then even in the Buffalo game, you know, they had – Buffalo only had 16 points for so long. Yeah, and so uh, I really kind of think you can make an, make an argument that they did start fast, at least through – partially through some of the three weeks. I wouldn't necessarily say I agree with it. Sam, you're making a face. <laughs> well, Matt, Matt has just put them as, as the best defense in the NFL, but <laughs> right. no, but in, in, but in fairness, like the, even, the, in, the, are the ones even that in the, even in the Eagles fire. game, it was several plays. Now those plays happened and the guy on their defense allowed them to happen. But, you know, in general, like they stopped Deandre Swift, they did, there's some good things. However, collectively, they're not getting it done. And, yeah. you know, you know, but that's the problem. So, you know, do you think that they can turn it around like they did last year? I I kind of do. <laughs> I don't. I mean, we'll see how it goes. Uh, you know, maybe the def or maybe the offense gets a little worse or stuff like that, and the defense plays uh, higher to the standards. I mean, it, I I guess it's just more so with like the explosives. I mean, this this defense though has shown that they they do a better job of cracking down on the explosives as the season goes along, and I think the explosives are the number one thing right now that's killing them. Now I don't know if they'll be as solid on third down whether they'll drastically improve there i think they have the they rank they have the 13th highest conversion percentage right now at 41 percent. at least they did going into the weekend so you know that was a thing that separated them last year why they were an awesome defense is because they had the best third down defense in football right. uh, and so you know sam i know you wrote this in your article the other day of it flipped in 20 and 22 and maybe it didn't flip in 21 maybe but if you remember in that 21 season, there was that four game winning streak where the defense was playing in, in kind of a top 10 fashion again. Maybe you see something like that where it bounces back for a little bit, but then they don't maintain it for the whole season. To Paris's point, and thanks for reading the other day. But Jack Del Rio, like the, if you were in Vegas, I think that the bet would be like they would be favored to go on a run like the defense at some point during this year because Jack Del Rio the i mean like we're watching the same movie over again like it's apollo you know it's like you know it, it's um it's the same thing it's they're gonna go on a run at some point and obviously like facing worse quarterbacks would help i think they're they're going to do that um you know with desmond ritter and, and whether daniel jones is, is back or not and um so I, I think that it's it's a good bet that they're going to but how long can they sustain it can they sustain it like they did in 20 and 22 or is it like 21 where they fall off and, and ultimately and and the other thing i would say is the thing that's different about this year is that they're actually subtracting someone in Derek forest who wasn't hurting them as much as players in past seasons if you remember like in week six in 2021 they moved landon collins from safety to linebacker downhill attacking style player or whatever they said um and then in 2022 they benched william jackson after four games and they said okay like we're going so jack del Rio doesn't have a chess move to make like that he's actually right. being forced to do it by an injury now so mm -hmm. can he still bounce back in the same way well sorry just to jump in real quick is emmanuel forbes that move i mean if you want to make I don't the think so. if, if you're if you're benching your first round pick i think that's a way bigger concern 
No, I, I mean, it is. I also but, wonder. But they did it. <laughs> right. But I don't know that the problem is like you had some options to go at corner that were more solid. And I don't know that, you know, will Danny Johnson be that kind of elixir for them? But, oh, but he did. You know, so I I don't know. I I, I also wonder, this is where I wonder if you go to more zone match, would that be better for Forbes? I don't, you know, if that, if you're getting away from that, will that help him? I don't know. Two two components here. One is that I think watching Emmanuel Forbes try to balance, hey, don't get beat deep, but also be the ball hawk you were drafted to be is going to be one of the most fascinating storylines of the next four weeks because they draft him to create turnovers, and now that he's taking shots and trying to create turnovers, they, you know, obviously. I it's think he can them. still be aggressive, but he's got to. I think the problem is the technique has been very inconsistent, and the and the details of his game have been inconsistent. And the, and the second got, one can improve there, right? And the second thing that I had is that Danny Johnson is the people's champion. I know that Ben Standing, it, that's his guy. But not only was he on Matt's flight, he sat in the middle row, right? Which is incredible to me, and. If you remember last year when they benched Christian Holmes in New York uh, for the game they tied, Danny Johnson had a huge blitz off the edge to get a sack to push them out of field goal range. And he had like another, he had like three passes defensed basically to help them tie that game. And so, well, I don't think he's the long-term solution by any means. Danny Johnson, Danny Johnson can help. ball oh, at points. Definitely. Definitely. He can definitely ball, but is he that kind of a, that, you know, now it could just be the plays you don't give up are what they need right now, right? Whether make you how many plays you make, but as long as you're not giving up these big 25 plus plays, that's where they've been killed. So that's that's the question. And if he can do that, get him out there. You know, but I still think Forbes is going to be heard from at some point because he's your first round pick. They're not going to let him just sit there, I don't think. So hey, let's we've got about a couple minutes left here. Let's switch real quickly to offense. Sam Howell. Has he surprised? Has he done what you thought? What have your what have your early just quick early impressions of what he's done through five games? The accuracy, where he's going. The accuracy to me has been the most surprising uh, part of this. I, I think he's looked pretty great in that regard. I know this system helps him out a lot with that, but I think if you're looking at him to be a viable solution for the long term, I kind of think that the poise. Um, are maybe the the two biggest strengths that he has, but the biggest concern for the rest of the season is, is going to be the sacks. I mean, right. if you told me that they would break the record for most sacks in a season by a quarterback, take uh, I would kind of bet right now that he sets the record. I mean, I, I don't really see this improving for the rest of the season, uh, at least for that. I worry about him holding up to be able to get a chance to break that record. What do you think, Sam? That's exactly what I was about to say, because, I mean, there's a lot of things that have not been surprising, right? The mobility, the arm strength, his ability to hunt and execute like baller throws or to get out of the pocket and move the chains on third down with his legs, like and taking all the sacks. You know, we we knew that was a thing with him back to North Carolina, getting the ball out on time, learning a new system with rhythm and timing and spacing like all. I think that we haven't been overly surprised, except maybe with the accuracy, particularly on the move. Uh, But will he hold up? Because. Not only does he lead the league in sacks, he leads the league in quarterback hits, 50. And, like, the record for hits in a season is only 131, which was set by Kirk Cousins last year. And so Sam Howell's not getting the ball out like that. And he's not even, I think, as big and and durable as Kirk is. And so, like, you just see some of those screens or some of those, you know, plays where he's getting the ball out even quickly. Like, he's still taking a lot of damage. And he's not a huge guy. And so I think it's it's a real big concern. And Charles Leno said he was concerned about – just yeah. Sam's ability to hold up. And and he was and he certainly advocated for them not keeping him in, in at the end of those blowout games and taking more hits, which I think at some point you absolutely have to think about that. But the other thing is along those lines is, and the last thing I'll say on this is he runs like a linebacker. So he had that third down and 10 in the red zone. He's trying to pick up those extra half yards by going through three guys. That's where it's like, I love the mindset, but man, that can get you in trouble. Anyways, listen, that that's all we go. We're going to run out of time here in a minute. So I do want to say thanks for coming on, Matt. It's been a pleasure watching you grow and develop as a reporter. We're going to miss you, Sam. You know, it's it's always fun to watch a young reporter grow, develop and get better. Sam, <laughs> good luck, because there's still time. So don't worry about that. Shout out, Mrs. Fortier. <laughs> Your son's doing a good job. But it is like, seriously, like it's been a pleasure, Matt. And so we will miss you. And, um, you know, you can come back and visit and stay in your old bedroom when you can. <laughs> right. 
So well, I don't Thank think you. the occupants will be too happy. So I said I said too many nice things about Matty P earlier. So I'm I'm just gonna be like get get lost, man. All right. All right. There you go. Thanks, guys. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Sam and Matt for joining me. And thank you, as always, for tuning in. I'll be back on Friday afternoon, Saturday morning, with my keys and a prediction for the Commander's game at the Atlanta Falcons. It's a big one, folks. Got to get it. Got no choice, because you can't let this season get away so early. Talk to you next time.